our whole country. The economy and also the immigration problem. A lot on the minds of voters across the West as they cast their ballots on this Super Tuesday. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to West Coast Wrap. I'm Alex Savage. It is the biggest day of the presidential primary season with voters in more than a dozen states and one U.S. territory casting ballots. And the polls are starting to close here in the West. Four West Coast states are part of Super Tuesday, Alaska, California, Utah and Colorado. The polls just closed in Utah and we are still waiting for returns to come in there. In Utah, Democrats are holding a primary with 30 delegates going to the winner there. Republicans are holding a caucus with the winner getting 40 delegates. And analysts do believe Utah may be Nikki Haley's best opportunity to beat former President Trump in a contest. Now, the polls closed in Colorado about one hour ago. 72 delegates on the line in the Democratic primary, 37 at stake in the Republican race. And here's a look at the latest numbers from Colorado with the Associated Press projecting former President Trump is going to win this race. On the Democratic side, the Associated Press has called the race for President Biden. Voters outside Denver went to the polls one day after a key ruling from the U.S. Supreme Court. The justices ruled former President Trump can remain on the ballot, rejecting a Colorado decision that disqualified him because of his actions leading up to January 6th. Voters who were willing to talk at the polling places today said they were focused on several key issues as they cast their ballots. Top of my mind is um, the abortion, the economy, and also the immigration problem. Our money is being spent in ways uh, by the federal and state government that, that's not responsible. Um, it's taking money away from, um, from programs that are needed uh, for schools and for children and, and for health care. All right, voters in California have a little less than one hour left to cast their ballots. This is a live look tonight at election workers in Los Angeles County working to process ballots that have already been turned in. Vote counts will not be revealed until the polls close at 8 o'clock local time. California is the state with the most delegates up for grabs in the race for president. 424 delegates will go to the winner of the Democratic primary. 169 delegates will go to the winner of the Republican primary. Fox's Sonny Sai talked with a political expert to get some insight on the contest unfolding today here in the West. California holds a lot of weight in the presidential contest today with nearly one third of the Democratic candidates and almost one fifth of the Republican candidates at stake. Tonight is another chance for GOP candidate Nikki Haley to slow former President Donald Trump in his path to the presidential ballot. President Biden has been cruising to the November ballot without great opposition. Similarly, former President Trump has been victorious in earlier contests this year. Despite Nikki Haley's first win in D.C. on Sunday, one politics expert says California's support for Trump has grown over the last year. If you, if you look at just a year ago in California, there was a statewide poll that showed that Trump had only 29 percent support among Republicans, and he was trailing DeSantis by eight points uh, just a year ago. And over the course of that year, he has uh, won back support of Republicans. Uh, the other challengers have fallen away. And so he's going to cruise now to victory in the Republican primary. California voters will also be voting for someone to finish the rest of the term held by the late Senator Dianne Feinstein. They will also be voting to elect the next senator for a full six year term. In Westlake Village, Sunnyside, Fox News. And in Alaska, only Republicans are voting today with a caucus that runs until 8 o'clock tonight local time. That's a little less than two hours from now. The winner of today's caucus will be awarded 29 delegates in the race for president. Democrats in Alaska will be holding a primary coming up on April 6th. Super Tuesday results will be a crucial tool for the front runners in the presidential race. That would be President Biden and former President Trump. We spoke earlier with David McEwen, who is a political analyst at Sonoma State University, who says it will be important for the Biden administration to keep an eye on how young Americans are casting their votes today. The Biden White House has to be more offensive. They have to go after those voters. And those voters uh, include uh, voters that are tend to be younger. Or we call them emerging voters. They're episodic voters. They don't vote as regularly, but they're concerned about Gaza. They're concerned about their pocketbook. They're concerned uh, about the age of these two candidates. 
As far as the Republican primary, Vermont is shaping up to be competitive tonight, and that could be an important tool for Nikki Haley's campaign as she tries to remain in the race. McEwen tells us if Haley wins a state, it will help her to make the case to moderate voters who do not want to cast their ballots for former President Trump. Now up at our website, westcoastwrap.com, you can stay on top of the Super Tuesday election results as they come in tonight. In addition to those results, you'll see how this year's Super Tuesday compares to Super Tuesdays from past presidential election cycles. Staying with politics now and a big political shakeup in Arizona is getting a lot of attention across the country on this election day. Independent Senator Kirsten Sinema announced today that she will not seek re-election. Tonight, Fox 10's Lauren Clark explains why Sinema says she wants out. Because I choose civility, understanding, listening, working together to get stuff done, I will leave the Senate at the end of this year. Arizona Senator Kirsten Sinema officially announcing she will not seek re-election. The decision not completely unexpected, says Tom Riley, professor of the School of Public Affairs at Arizona State University. It's not unexpected, uh, particularly since her fundraising was down. Uh, she hadn't begun the de uh, collection of signatures that's required to run as an independent candidate. So I think there was a lot of expectation that uh, perhaps she was not going to run. Today's announcement squashing the possibility of a three party November race. Cinema, elected to the Senate in 2018, was known as a key negotiator for bipartisan laws. She later switched her party affiliation from Democrat to independent in November of 2022. Now the impact of her decision on the minds of consultants like Stan Barnes with Copper State Consulting. The happiest person in Arizona today is Congressman Ruben Gallego because he is set with a unified Democratic Party behind him against the Republican nominee, no matter who it is, that it has to lead a fractured Republican Party. Noble Predictive Insights polling also suggesting that Democrat Ruben Gallego would take a 10-point lead against Republican frontrunner Carrie Lake with 16% undecided. Compare that polling with Cinema in the race, cutting Gallego's lead to three points. Although Riley points out how independents vote could be key and could surprise people on election day. All over the place. Um, you know, from one election to another, they, they move in and out of independent status, they switch parties. So I think trying to gauge the independent vote will be a real challenge. But whatever happens, I think all eyes really could be on Arizona. John Seaton with Camelback Strategy Group expects a high profile down to the wire race. A 5149 Senate now and the 51st seat could very well go right through Maricopa County in Arizona. So I think a lot of national attention, if it wasn't already, is going to be on Arizona. And that was Fox 10's Lauren Clark reporting for us tonight. Senator Sinema has not announced what she plans to do after leaving office. Well, after much anticipation, new renderings have been released of the proposed Las Vegas Stadium for the Oakland A's. The new renderings show tiered seating bowls and a fixed roof. It plans to seat 33,000 people. The stadium roof opens up toward the north to allow in natural light and views of the Vegas Strip. Bjark Ingalls Group is the lead designer on this $1.5 billion project. The ballpark is slated to open in time for the 2028 season. Up next tonight on West Coast Wrap, Washington poised to make a stripper's bill of rights the law. Tonight, how legislation that's on the governor's desk would protect dancers on the job. Also, checking in for six months. More on a Washington astronaut's warm welcome to the International Space Station. And a live look at the Sierra near Truckee this evening where snow flurries continue to fall ahead of another storm that will bring rain and snow to California. More on this coming up. All right, turning back now to tonight's Super Tuesday election results, and they are beginning to trickle in here from the state of Utah. We're voting just wrapped up about 10 minutes ago at the top of the hour, and here is a look at the Republican caucus in that state, and the results are in, and we have a tight race here. You can see former President Trump with 58% support among vo voters here, uh, and Nikki Haley with 40% support, uh, and just a fraction of the votes are in at this point. So we'll keep an eye, continue to keep an eye on that race. Now, turning over to the Democratic primary that's happening in Utah tonight, and you can see a landslide victory here for President Biden here with 88 percent support tonight. So he looks on his way to winning Utah's primary. 
We move on here and hundreds of adult dancers in Washington state are fighting for better protections on the job. Their so-called Bill of Rights now makes its way to the governor's desk for signature after passing through the House and Senate with considerable support. As Fox 13's Lauren Donovan reports, if it passes, this bill would establish the most comprehensive protections for adult dancers to date. When we have a dynamic here that exploits dancers and has a predatory model, it really encourages clubs to just allow abusive customers back in because there is some profit in that. And of course, we have been struggling with keeping doors open. Everything from being tipped on stage to giving lap dances is illegal as a dancer. Megaphone in hand, Madison Zach Wu has spent countless hours on the front line of this fight. So we've been working towards getting these broad changes for the industry for about six years now. Testifying and touting her cause to lawmakers in Olympia. We had like over a hundred people show up. People were wearing their stripper outfits. They were wearing very like queer and proud outfits. We had the pole down there. At long last, their mission has gained traction, passing through both the Senate and House with considerable support. I'm really hoping that the governor signs this bill into law. Governor Jay Inslee is expected to sign Senate Bill 6105, creating a stripper's bill of rights, making way for sweeping protections that will safeguard adult entertainment workers. The legislation calls on clubs to step up their game, mandating they install panic buttons, especially in rooms where dancers are alone with customers. It'll also require reporting allegations of customer violence and criminal behavior. The customer blacklists are very essential to making sure that if a customer crosses boundaries that they can be reported. Data showing just how many performers have been harmed or threatened at the clubs is hard to come by, but that's because dancers say owners can choose not to hire them if they're being difficult with customers. You may also be surprised to hear that right now these businesses are not required to hire security. If signed into law, that'll change too. Madison says the issues exposed by the so-called raids of queer bars in Capitol Hill a few weeks back brought to light the ridiculousness of Washington State's lewd conduct law, a rule prohibiting the sale of alcohol in strip clubs. I think that a lot of people's initial reaction to the queer club raids were like, that's terrible, that shouldn't happen. The governor has the ability to alter that as well. But even if he puts pen to paper, Madison predicts it'll be some time before you can buy more than a lemonade inside these adult venues. We're probably thinking about a year when, once we see alcohol in the strip clubs. And that was Fox 13's Lauren Donovan reporting for us tonight. Some Republican lawmakers have said they support protecting dancers in the industry, but it's challenging to know the best way to regulate it. Well, a lot of digging out is happening up in the Sierra. Today, Nevada's Transportation Department posted these images online as crews continue working to clear Mount Rose Highway, which is on the north side of Lake Tahoe. They say crews have been working throughout the day and night to clear about seven feet of snow off of the roadways. Chain controls have finally been lifted for drivers on California's Highway 50 and Interstate 80 up around Tahoe. You can see conditions in this area much improved today with much better visibility than we've seen uh, over the past few days and over the weekend. The region is finally starting to dry out from this weekend's blizzard. Despite how bad the roads had gotten, some people say they've actually seen them worse in the past. For more, let's bring in KTVU meteorologist Rosemary Orozco, who is tracking the conditions across the west. And Rosemary, another storm is headed our way. Yes, uh, thankfully this storm moving towards Southern California, Alex. And so outside of a few snow flurries for the Lake Tahoe area, they are finally getting a bit of a break. How about areas over the Pacific Northwest also beginning to see a break? Seattle today, 45 degrees under partly sunny, partly cloudy conditions as the storm continues to move out. Now, Southern California enjoying blue skies today. Here's a view over Santa Monica, 60, 60 afternoon high. This will lead to bigger changes for tomorrow in the Lake Tahoe area with rain and snow on the way. Here's a view of the West Coast satellite radar, and we have, again, just a little bit of lingering moisture here as this continues to push out. But tomorrow, the Pacific Northwest will be looking good. Meanwhile, this system here off our coastline is going to move closer to the coast and then shift towards Southern California. 
and that is why that area is expected to get the brunt of the moisture with tomorrow's storm. Meanwhile, the winter storm warnings as well as the winter weather advisories continue for parts of Idaho into uh, tonight. Meanwhile, areas of Oregon into early tomorrow morning and areas over northern California as well. But as we shift towards southern California, these advisories begin tomorrow and go until Thursday and some accumulations of snow expected above 6,500 feet will be four to eight inches and those snow levels expected to be down to about 4,500 feet. So these advisories here uh, are for Ventura, uh, LA and uh, San Diego counties and that will last until early Thursday morning. The forecast on the timeline notice again the Pacific Northwest getting a little bit of a break there but California is going to be wet tomorrow. We will see that storm kind of roll over Southern California and then by Thursday morning it is moving into areas like Utah as well as Colorado and areas over Arizona. The rainfall amounts of for tomorrow, Los Angeles again going to take the brunt of this, could see anywhere from three quarters of an inch to about an inch or so. And the Sierra, we're talking about the greater Lake Tahoe area. Once again, notice not much in the way of accumulation, which is snow flurries, a possibility. The West Coast of forecast for the next to three days, I've given you a view here. So wet for California tomorrow, but quickly drying out with a couple of dry days. Areas over Arizona expected to see some scatter shower activity on Thursday where we do have the MLB training festivities going on. Alex. All right, Rosemary, thank you. Well, a lot of people flocking to Las Vegas right now to take part in some novel medical achievements. They're trying to get taller with limb lengthening surgeries. Fox's Kim Passoff explains how one specific medical institute has become a leader of these world class operations. People have called me short and I'm like five nine isn't short. This father of three and small business owner from here in Las Vegas asked not to be identified. Let's go ahead and take a shot at the top of the hip. But he allowed us in the operating room at Sunrise Hospital. Which is the actual separation in the bone. He is one of the first people in the world to get a new medical device to lengthen his legs. The newly FDA approved Precise Max at the hands of orthopedic surgeon Dr. Kevi Debprashad, known to his patients as Dr. D. Vegas is often the first in many realms, like entertainment, the culinary industry, uh, now the sporting industry with Super Bowl and F1, um, but we tend not to be the first sometimes in the medical or educational. After training at Harvard, Dr. D came to Las Vegas to set up one of the premier sites for limb lengthening in the world, the Limplastic Institute. He has done hundreds of the bone growing procedures on people from around the world and not just cosmetic. For deformity, congenital deformity, traumatic injuries, um, sometimes if someone has cancer, you can resect part of the bone out and then regrow the bone. This patient has been saving for this cosmetic procedure since 2016. The cost, around $80,000. His height has bothered him for 20 years. I guess it would date back when I was like 14, 15, going through puberty, kind of hoping that, you know, I'll be taller than the rest of my siblings. You know, and even though I am taller than pretty much everyone in my family, it doesn't compare to like, you know, out there in the real world. After he fully recovers, he should be about six feet tall. And thanks to the new device with stronger rods, he will literally be back on his feet faster than any of Dr. D's previous patients. The patient will be able to walk um, right away because of the increased weight bearing capacity of the implant. Throughout my life, people that are taller always have advantages. Hugo Ramirez went from 5'9 to 6'1 last year after his procedure and being confined to a bed for a three month recovery. I couldn't walk. I had to learn how to walk all over again. Next month, he will come back to Vegas for a second procedure with the new device with the goal of reaching six foot four. I'm still getting the rush off of being six one. It hasn't changed. I can only imagine what the rush is going to be on six four or six three six four. And that was Fox 5's Kim Passoff reporting for us tonight. Dr. D has also been featured on a streaming special on Hulu that focuses on these cosmetic procedures. His practice has also become so popular that he's had to move his office over to a 14,000 square foot facility. Up next tonight on West Coast Wrap, a Washington astronaut is hundreds of miles high tonight. Coming up his thoughts after arriving at the International Space Station. Plus, tumbleweeds taking over entire neighborhoods in Utah, burying cars and houses. Up next tonight, the massive cleanup effort after a wild windstorm. 
We turn tonight to a bizarre scene in Utah. Plows and other heavy equipment are moving into some neighborhoods there to clean massive mounds of tumbleweed. Fox 13's Amy Nay shows us what people outside Salt Lake City have been dealing with at their doorsteps for days now. Light rain is expected to stop at 29 minutes. I didn't even realize it was raining. This is the first time I've ever seen anything like this. I've had a few in my backyard a few years before, but nothing like this. <laughs> There's just so many tumbleweeds we There's can't keep road. up. Local residents of Eagle Mountain amazed at the mounds of tumbleweeds that have accumulated right out their front doors. And this whole street was blocked off in two areas. Tumbleweeds, uh, one, one uh, pile of tumbleweeds was almost as high as the first story on the house. Glenn Phillip, a local LDS bishop in Eagle Mountain, out with young men and women in his ward to help with a massive cleanup effort. These piles are what's left after their service project Sunday. They actually took the first load out the city. Thousands of tumbleweeds blowing into these neighborhoods Saturday, some of them larger than four feet around after our area's wild windstorm. Now they're all in my front yard blocking our street. We got home, then they started blocking this part of the street. That street was all blocked. Eagle Mountain resident Michelle Reed Guerrera says it started with just a few tumbleweeds in her backyard on Friday, but turned into a much bigger problem. People were trying to drive through them and got to the point where you couldn't. And the cleanup effort, Michelle says, while admirable as far as how it's brought their community together, thanks to Mother Nature, has been a real mess. After we had all these piles, then next thing we know, all the snow is piling on them. So now it's fun trying to move them with all this cold, wet, muddy ground. That pasture area is completely open and there's a lot of tumbleweeds in that area. Uh, and uh, so it just invaded the neighborhood. Yeah, there was no way to stop it. They're planning more cleanup throughout the week after some of the strongest winds he's ever seen in this area. The sky was very hazy and uh, it was full of debris and uh, probably some of the largest wind that I've seen here. Yeah, it was just straight line winds coming from the south and that's exactly where the tumbleweeds came from. An unbelievable scene there in Utah and that was Fox's Amy Nay reporting for us tonight. The city did leave three dumpsters for people to dispose of all of those remaining tumbleweeds, but the bishop you heard from there in the piece is concerned that will not be enough to clean up the mess. Four astronauts, including one man from Washington, have arrived at the International Space Station. Well, first thing, it's just great to be back. There's such a, a sense of familiarity and homeness uh, to the station. And I uh, can't wait to get back to work. I know that our flight's going to go by in a blink of an eye and uh, really anxious to start. Thanks for the very warm welcome from Crew 7. You won't be able to see Earth behind it okay. anymore because it'll be in front of the space. We are and that is how Michael Barrett from Camas, Washington, got a six-month stay at the space station started today. He piloted his crew to the destination after launching from Florida's Kennedy Space Center on Sunday. His crew of four people joined up with another crew already at the station. They're expected to conduct several experiments during their stay. One thing they're studying is the effect of long duration space travel on the human body, and that work will help NASA prepare for future long duration missions to the lunar south pole. And that does it for West Coast Wrap tonight. We appreciate you watching. And a reminder, before we go, you can stay up to date on all the stories we're covering here in the West. Just head to our website. That's westcoastwrap.com. Have a great night.